This morning's scripture reading will be taken from the book of Matthew, the 15th chapter. I'll begin at verse 21, concluding at verse 28. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. If you're going to follow in the Pew Bibles, we'll, we'll be at on page 1130, page 1130. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she, answered, and she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Amen. a great day and we're thankful for each one present. If you're visiting, we're thankful that you have come our way and we hope that you'll come back at every opportunity to worship with us here at South Trail. If you are visiting from the community, we are especially glad that you have found us and we hope that you will give us the opportunity to get to know you and that you will return uh, often. This past week was a holiday week, uh, Thanksgiving. I thought I'd ask a couple of questions. That is, if the pilgrims were still alive today, for what do you think they would be most thankful? If the pilgrims were still alive today, what do you think they'd be most thankful? I think it would be their age, don't you? <laughs> there was a little second grade teacher, uh, she was teaching her class, she asked them to write a short composition about what they were thankful for. Little Timothy, you know, being a second grader, she asked him, she said, Timothy, what are you most thankful for? He said, I'm most thankful I'm not a turkey came across this little poem and I thought I'd read it to you just real quickly just to make sure now you really realize these jokes are always just to make sure you're awake at the beginning all right these are just to get your attention Twas the night of Thanksgiving but I just couldn't sleep I tried counting backwards I tried counting sheep the leftovers beckoned the dark meat and white but I fought the temptation with all of my might tossing and turning with anticipation the thought of a snack became infatuation so I raced to the kitchen, flung open the door, and gazed at the fridge full of goodies galore. I gobbled up turkey and buttered potatoes, stuffing with gravy, green beans, and tomatoes. I felt myself swelling so plump and so round, till all of a sudden I rose off the ground. I crashed through the ceiling, floating into the sky, with a mouthful of pudding and a handful of pie. But I managed to yell as I soared past the trees, happy eating to all, Pass the cranberries, please. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but uh, not a bad thought. The passage that uh, Kaz read for us there in Matthew 15, there's a companion passage in Mark chapter 7. I wanted us to think about this today. I wonder how many of you had leftovers after Thursday. We've still got some leftovers, and they are just as good as the first meal on Thursday. I'm not kidding. They are delicious. I'm looking forward to to this afternoon having a turkey sandwich and whatever else is left uh, there in the refrigerator. But the main thing about food is, does it satisfy you? Are you still hungry after you've eaten? There are times, there are some things that you eat and you're still hungry, but does it satisfy you? When we look at this story here, there's something that is quite satisfying 
about the way in which this woman, this mother, approached Jesus. When you look at this story of Jesus in Tyre and Sidon, the question is, why did Jesus withdraw from public at times? I know there were times that Jesus went off, he went into the mountain early in the morning or to pray, but there were other times that Jesus needed to escape the Pharisees. If you look at your outline there in the bulletin, there were times that Jesus withdrew to escape from the Pharisees. There was opposition. And during the years of Jesus' earthly ministry, over about three and a half years, that opposition grew. In John chapter 5 and verse 16, after Jesus had healed the lame man, the paralytic there in John 5, who was at the pool of Bethesda, and after Jesus healed him, it says that the Jews wanted to kill him because he did these things on the Sabbath day. Two verses later, after Jesus has said in John 5, 17, that his father was working and that he is working until now, they wanted to kill him. This time, not just because he had done those things on the Sabbath, but because he made himself equal with the father. And so it says they sought all the more to kill him. The Jews, the Pharisees, their opposition. But Jesus also escaped or withdrew so he could teach the twelve. The disciples needed to hear certain things. In Matthew chapters 15 to 20, this is in the period of time from the third Passover in Jesus' ministry until the week that he enters into Jerusalem, the last week of his life leading up to the crucifixion. So this is toward the end of the ministry and the the opposition has intensified, and Jesus needs to prepare the disciples. So in Matthew's chapters 16, 17, and 20, three times Jesus talks to them about his departure, the fact that his death is coming, it's imminent. And Jesus is trying to help them to see that this is the plan, that there's a purpose that God has, and oh, the disciples struggle. They say to Jesus, no, that's not going to happen. We'll be there. We'll intervene. We're on your side. We'll fight with you. And of course, Jesus' plan is not to fight in a military fashion, but for Jesus to complete the will of the Father in dying on the cross and being resurrected from the tomb. So here, Jesus uses this withdrawal. There at Tyre and Sidon, probably the northernmost place that Jesus goes during his ministry. You realize Jesus was born at Bethlehem and probably never traveled more than about 200 miles from the place of his birth. Some of you have traveled a lot more this week than what Jesus traveled in his lifetime. Understand, Jesus' purpose is always in front of him. Jesus' part of what God's plan is to save mankind, to redeem man, is always in the forethought of Jesus' interactions and Jesus' relationships with the people here on this foreign soil. And back in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 24, Jesus was talking about all the miracles that he'd done. He said, woe to Chorazin and woe to Bethsaida. If the things that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would still be here to this day. In fact, he says it will be more tolerable for the people of Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for those who had seen his mighty works. What we recognize is that Jesus' miracles were never just about the miracle. It was always pointing to his purpose, to his person, to his identity as the Son of God. I want you to think about this woman, this mother, who approaches Jesus and the conversation that she has. As she approaches Jesus, she's asking she's shouting for help and she says to him lord son of david have mercy on me and that's to get his attention she's calling to him for help but as she does this notice it says that she kept asking the disciples become annoyed by her presence and finally what they say is they say send her away now we look at that and we say well don't you have any compassion she, she's got a daughter who's demon-possessed, and she is asking for help because of the love of a mother. There's not a single mother in this audience or here this morning who would not want to help a troubled child. A child that is demon-possessed, you would want to do everything possible to help relieve 
their suffering, you would do what this woman was doing. Maybe when the disciples said, send her away, maybe they were saying, give her what she's asking so she'll go away. Maybe it's not that they didn't have any compassion, but maybe it's just they wanted it to stop. Jesus had entered into a house, it tells us there in Mark chapter 7, because he didn't want people to, to notice. He didn't want people to, to throng him like they did time after time, place after place. But Jesus could not be hidden. This woman finds him and seeks his help. When you look at the conversation that takes place, it is a little puzzling. That is, Jesus has a conversation with her, and he tells her that the bread, that is, he's been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it's the children's bread, that is, it's the Jews who are supposed to see this. Now, you may look at you that and you may say, well, but wait a minute. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, the whole world. God loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, right? I think I read that somewhere, all right? Understand, yes, Jesus ultimately would be for the whole world, for those who were far off, the Gentiles. But his ministry, while Jesus was on earth, the Jews had been given the prophecies. The Jews had been given, if you will, that prophetic portrait of who Jesus was to be. And so while he was on earth, he was fulfilling the things that had been prophesied. He was doing these things to fulfill the promise of hope and a future that were given to Israel. And so Jesus was sent to the house of Israel. Once Jesus was properly vetted, I don't know if you've heard that word recently with all the political things, but once Jesus was properly vetted by the Jews, that is that they could look at all that was said and all that was done and say, that's him, that's the Messiah, he's the one. Then the message would go into all the world. But so what Jesus says is that I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel or on this occasion that the children's bread, it belonged to the Jews. And he said, it wouldn't be right. What kind of a parent would take the food that was needed to feed their hungry children and feed it to the little dogs? Some people look at this and they'll say, is Jesus calling this woman a dog? That's not what the passage said. The Jews would refer to Gentiles as dogs, but the word they used was a different word. And it was the kind of dogs that ran in packs and that they would eat out of the street or at the dump, the wild dogs. The little dogs were the ones kind of like some people, some of you may have at your house, the little pets. The little dogs were the ones that were friendly and they would be the, the little vacuum cleaner underneath the table. All right? At least that's what one of the things dogs are good for is cleaning up the crumbs. And so what Jesus says about the crumbs here and then, I mean, what the woman says to Jesus about the crumbs is yes, but even the dogs, the little dogs, get to eat the crumbs. Think about this woman's faith, that she wants even a morsel from Jesus, that she's willing to accept whatever mercy because why is she asking? She's asking because of the love that a mother has for her child. If you look at your outline there, I want you to notice what this woman was willing to do and what we should be willing to do to receive the morsels of mercy that come from God, to be able to see and receive daily the blessings that God has for our lives that, that come not just because God has offered salvation in Jesus Christ, but for those who are in a saved relationship, those who have entered into Christ, there are blessings, there are mercies of God that flow into the Christian's life. But notice that this woman, first, she came desperately. Where else should, could she go? Where, what, where else could she turn? The demon possession wasn't something that she could just go to a doctor or just go ask anybody on the street. If you look at your Bibles in Isaiah chapter 55, one of those great passages that talks about how high God is. But look at where it starts in Isaiah 55, beginning of verse 6. Here the prophet says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. If you look at this, how high is God? God is so much higher than we are. God is so much greater that we must seek our needs from Him. We must approach God. This past week, we have a national holiday called Thanksgiving. I know you ate. I know you probably had some time with family or friends. You had some traditions maybe that you were keeping. Maybe you watched some football. Maybe you just had a lot of fun. The question is, did you take time to thank God? Were you forgetful of all of his blessings? Or were you mindful? Were you thoughtful? Were you thankful for the things that God has given you? The mercies of God. Call upon him while he is near. If we recognize that we must depend upon God, we can do what the woman did secondly. Look at what it says. She came humbly. She came humbly. She came and fell at his feet. She came to Jesus because he was the only one who could help, but she came to him in recognition that he was God. Her dependence upon God. The proximity as she came close to him. If you have your Bibles, turn over to James chapter 4. Notice how James describes the way in which God brings us up and blesses us. In James 4 and verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. In 1874, Fanny Crosby, the hymn writer, she's written, oh, more than half a dozen songs even that are in our, our songbook. She was blind. She could tell the difference between night and day, but she couldn't make out or distinguish anything uh, very discernible. In 1874, she was short for the rent that she needed to pay in one particular month. She said, as she recorded this event, that she was $10 short. Now, $10 may not sound like a lot of money today, but $10 in 1874 was a lot. She prayed. A couple of hours later, somebody came to the door. It was a stranger, but somebody that had heard of her reputation, the songs that she had written, and he just pressed into her hand a $10 bill. I'm not telling you that if you are short some money that you pray and the exact money, the exact amount will all of a sudden come to you. But Fanny Crosby wrote this song after that took place. When she received what she needed to be able to pay her rent, she wrote the song, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul athirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit, clothed immortal, wings its flight to realms of day. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. All the way my Savior leads me. This woman came desperately. She came humbly. Thirdly, she came reverently. She didn't just fall at his feet, but she worshipped him. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus never refused the worship that people offered 
because Jesus came as the Word in flesh. Jesus was the Word incarnate. Jesus was God among us, reverently. Jesus taught the disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Recognizing and reverencing God helps us in so many ways. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. If you don't recognize who God is, you're not going to reverence God. You're not going to respect God in every way. But when you do have reverence for God, oh, everything else falls into place. Because God becomes first in your life. This son of David was a phrase that was used in the Old Testament. There was a promise to David that his seed would reign on the throne forever. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16, there's also reverences of the servant or the shepherd David in Psalm 89 and Ezekiel 34 and 37. Throughout the Old Testament, this anticipation, the son of David is a messianic term. It is the Christ. So when she uses this, she reverences him in another way, that he is the fulfillment of what God has promised, that Jesus has come to fulfill this promise. When you think about the Old Testament, David is the one who gathered together all of those materials for the construction of the temple. Solomon would build that temple as a house of worship, as a place for the, for the Jews to assemble, to reverence God, to worship him with fear to love him with all their being. Hiram was the king of Tyre, and he sent there in 1 Chronicles uh, 12, he sent a lot of the supplies, uh, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 22, verse 4, he sent a lot of the supplies, the wood, some of the cedar that they were going to need for that construction. So even Tyre and Sidon had had that relationship with David even before. Fourthly, she came boldly because of the love of her daughter. She didn't hesitate. She didn't say, well, he's gone into this house. I'll just have to wait out here until he comes out. No, she is calling. She is shouting. She is persisting to have the relief, the help that she needs. What is it in your life that you want to ask God, but are you willing to approach him boldly? The Hebrew writer says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God has the ability to help us. We have to be able to come in Jesus' name. We have to be able to have a relationship with God. And this is why it's so important. If someone has never obeyed the gospel and has never been baptized into Christ, then they don't have the relationship. Let me see if I can illustrate this. A father wanted to take his children to the county fair. And of course, when they went to the county fair, they, they could look at the animals and all for a few minutes, but you know what they wanted to do at the fair. They wanted to ride the rides. So the father goes and he gets, buys a whole roll of tickets. And his ch children come up to him and they want to ride this ride. He tears off the number of tickets for each of them. At one of the particular rides that all of his kids wanted to ride, he gives each of them the tickets. And as he's handing it out to each of his children, all of a sudden, here comes this other little boy. And the father all of a sudden looks at him, and he pulls back his tickets. He goes, you're not my son. His boy runs over, and he says, Dad, this is my friend. I told him that you would give him the tickets for this ride. What did the father do? Because it was in his son's name, the father tore off the tickets and gave it to this boy who was a friend of his son. God has given all blessings in Jesus Christ. In Jesus name we have access to the throne of grace. In Jesus name we have the ability to have the mercy of God flow into our lives in every area. We have his promise of his presence. We have his promise of his care and his love. God gives us what we need but we must have that relationship through his son Jesus Christ. And then, fifthly, she came submissively. Submissively. 
In other words, I don't know what she expected that Jesus would have her to do. Maybe she thought there was something that Jesus would tell her to go or to do before her daughter would be healed. But I want you to notice the commendation that Jesus gives her here in Matthew 15 and verse 28. A woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. Only two times did Jesus commend faith. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10, there was a centurion who came on behalf of his servant. And Jesus said, I have not found such great faith. No, not even in Israel. In other words, the children who were supposed to be eating the bread, they didn't trust God as much as this centurion who was seeking God's help through Jesus. This woman, this Syrophoenician woman, in Tyre and Sidon, comes seeking Jesus' healing power for her daughter, her faith. She persisted. The disciples were annoyed. You know, send her away. She kept asking. Jesus challenges her and says it's not right to give the children's bread to the, to the dogs, to the little dogs. That doesn't send her away. She's not discouraged. She's looking for the crumbs. She's looking for a morsel because she knows that anything by the power of God, is a blessing for her daughter and for herself. The hardest response is when there is no response. Jesus waited. Jesus let her keep asking. Do you remember when they brought the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8? Jesus stooped down and, and with his finger he started writing in the sand. It was like he didn't even hear them. He ignored them for a period of time and then he finally stood said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. See, Jesus' pause is a time for reflection. Maybe you've been praying for some answer. Maybe you've been asking God, and God wants you to depend upon him. He wants you to deepen your reverence, your humility, your submission. God hears you when you pray. God will answer. Maybe you've heard of this little lady that used to live over in India. Her name was uh, Mother Teresa. When Mother Teresa was doing her work among the poorest of the poor in India, and she even won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979, she had a little motto, and this was what she said when people would ask about her ministry. She said, help one person at a time and start with the person nearest you. Help one person at a time and start with the person nearest you. Nearest you. Think about the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Because God blesses us, mercy and love should flow in our lives toward those around us. And there are people near you. I, I don't necessarily mean the person sitting right next to you this morning, though it could be. The person to your left or to your right, there is somebody that you have the opportunity to share and spread the mercy of God. Are your hands open or are your hands closed? Is your heart open or is your heart closed? Are your eyes open or are your eyes closed? Is your mouth open or is it closed? To be able to encourage, to be able to spread the love of God, to teach the gospel, to be able to share the mercy and the grace of God with those who are around you. God has put people in your life that only you have the opportunity to share His blessing with them. You. You're the point of contact. You're the person that's in the proximity. You're the person that has the knowledge. You're the person who has experienced the, the wonderful grace and love of God to be able to spread that good news to those around you. When you think about this woman, she's commended. She received much more than her request. Not only was her daughter healed that very hour, the demon was, was driven out, the demon is gone, but she has received what Jesus and Jesus alone could give. She has experienced the response of God in her life. So many people today need the love of God in their lives. They need to be able to experience it. Sometimes it may feel like it's just crumbs, but when we go to God and when we ask believing, we will receive those things in the way that God knows is best. Jesus prayed in the garden, if at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Well, the cup didn't pass. Jesus did die on the cross. But what we understand is that that was the best 
that God could show his love and demonstrate it to everyone else. And there are things that have happened in your life that allow others to see the love of God and the mercy of God because you are relying on God. Your faith, your trust in him. When we talk about the gospel, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Understand that by putting your faith in Jesus, by recognizing him as the Lord and the son of David, you recognize that he is the source of all those blessings. By turning from your sins, you're saying, I want to live for God. And you're saying, I want to put my life in God's hands. And by being immersed in the waters of baptism, you are saying, God, I am submitting to what you have commanded so that I can receive what you have promised. This morning, have you received what God has promised? Have you received those blessings that only God can give in your obedience to the gospel? When St. Paul's Cathedral in London was being painted, Sir James Thornhill was commissioned to paint inside the dome. He had to stand for hours in a swinging scaffold to be able to paint that cupola up at the top of the dome. At one point, he had worked for several days on this one part of the, the painting. And he stood back to kind of admire it, and he started stepping back. He was lost in wonder and admiration for that work that he had committed. And one of the other artists saw that if he took one more step back, he was going to fall off of the scaffolding. And very quickly, that artist just took his brush and just made a swath across the, the piece of art. Sir James Thornhill was immediately angry, and he stepped forward. Why have you done this? What were you thinking? The artist explained the rather unusual circumstance that he was truly afraid that Mr. Thornhill was about to step off the scaffold and, and fall to his death. And then Mr. Thornhill embraced the artist and thanked him profusely. He said, you saved my life. I had lost myself. There may be some here today who have lost themselves and maybe you're about to step off of the scaffolding. You recognize that God and God alone can save you. What we want you to realize is that God in his word is offering you the very salvation that you need most. We are only his instruments. We are only his servants. And what we are trying to tell you and what we are trying to, to hopefully reach out in love and mercy today is with the word that God has given us. The word that offers his love and his hope to every one of us. If this morning you know you need to obey the gospel, step down to the front and we'll be glad to assist you. If you realize in your life that you have not even been receiving the crumbs that fall from the master's table because you have separated yourself from where you should be in your relationship with God, come home today. If we can encourage you in any way, we're going to stand and we're going to sing this song. We encourage you to step to the front right now while we do that, while we stand and while we sing.